Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Fortman, and I'm the Commissioner of the Maine Department of Labor. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our um, legislative briefing on unemployment insurance. Uh, we are now doing those briefings every other week. I do want to say that we are having technical uh, difficulties with Facebook, and so uh, this presentation will be recorded and then um, posted on Facebook after we're done. Um, so I'd like to uh, let my um, colleague introduce herself now. Good afternoon. My name is Kim Smith, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner. And uh, what we will do is uh, go through our normal process, which is we'll show you several slides, give you an update on where things are at since we spoke the last time, and then open it up for uh, questions from legislators, you can either unmute yourself and ask those questions or put the questions in the chat box as we're going through uh, the presentation and we will answer those um, at the end of the uh, slide presentation. So uh, the issue that we are receiving the most questions about is the Lost Wage Assistance Program which, as uh, you know, is not an unemployment insurance program. This was the $300 per week provided through the um, Lost Wage Assistance uh, Program at FEMA. And just as a reminder, um, that program was for six weeks, weeks um, August 1st through September 5th. Uh, we know that that time has passed. Um, we also are still identifying some people who are eligible, and we are paying those people retroactively. As a reminder, the uh, eligibility requirements for the Lost Wage Assistance Program is a little bit different than either the state unemployment insurance program or the federal pandemic unemployment assistance program. For Lost Wage Assistance, Someone must be eligible for unemployment benefits, and that could either be state unemployment or pandemic unemployment. They must um, be eligible for a weekly benefit amount of at least $100. Um, that, that doesn't mean that you must receive $100. You could be eligible for $100 and have taxes removed and therefore actually receive less than $100. Um, but you must be, your weekly benefit amount must be at least $100. That could mean someone who uh, had a weekly benefit amount of $82 and also had two dependents, um, which brought them up over the $100. Also, um, the person must be unemployed or partially unemployed as a direct result of COVID-19. Now, that eligibility requirement is a little bit different than pandemic unemployment assistance. So many people received an additional request for information from us. Um, if you have received that request, please complete the form, uh, or it's really an online opportunity, but we tell you how to answer it, how to access the question so that you can answer it online. Um, and uh, we will um, make those uh, payments to those individuals. As of uh, September 16th, almost 62,000 people had received um, the lost wage assistance payment, and about 650 people were not eligible um, that we know of uh, because they had a weekly benefit amount of less than $100. There are still other people that we are looking at, evaluating uh, their eligibility, sending questions to them. So again, we encourage people, if you receive either an email from the department or um, a letter through the Postal Service, please look at that information and respond to uh, the directions that are in there so that we can determine if, in fact, you are eligible for these lost wage assistance payments. Because this is not an unemployment insurance program, these payments are not made at the same time as your weekly unemployment insurance benefit. They are processed separately, and we have been processing those once a week. This week we are um, 
processing them twice, um, and we will uh, adjust as, it, as things move forward. But again, it's an ongoing eligibility that we're looking at information, and our goal is to make sure that anyone who is eligible has an opportunity to answer the questions and receive this benefit. Next slide, please. Um, Kim, do you want to do this or do you want me to jump in? We're shifting over to work search. Sure. Um, so uh, you may have seen in our announcements earlier this week that work search related activities will be required for all individuals who are applying for unemployment starting with the week beginning October 4th. So during that week, individuals will need, either need to be looking for work or participating in one of the expanded activities. This could mean participating in one of our career center workshops, taking advantage of the Coursera uh, free classes that we're offering, or some other um, skill development that's related to their job. The first time that that would have to be reported would be for the uh, October 11th for the week ending October 10th. Um, and we're doing this because work search and, and related activities, as we've expanded it, is a basic tenet of the unemployment program. Uh, normally, we're asking people if they are able to work, if they're available to work, and they're actively seeking work. So again, this is just an example of some of the expanded activities um, that uh, will count as work search activities. Um, the goal here is to make sure that people stay connected to the workforce um, and that uh, even uh, if people are um, uh, staying at home for a variety of reasons, what can, be, what can we help you with so that you can hone your skills? Um, one of the items that I don't think is up here, and I'm not sure if we have it on another slide, is that um, there are, there's an opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions with career center counselors over the telephone. So again, we recognize that not everyone has access to a computer or is comfortable using a computer, we're trying to expand the options for people as much as possible so that uh, you can stay connected um, to the workforce. Uh, we've heard from some people who are saying even if they have a computer, um, that they, they're using this time to really hone those skills and uh, focus on practicing them. Because in the world that we're living in, where so many things are remote um, and we're all using technology much more than, um, well, many of us are using technology more than we have in the past. But that, that is a, a skill that uh, we all need to um, enhance and develop. And we're trying to make sure that there are a number of opportunities um, for folks to focus on those kinds of skills as well. The, as Kim mentioned, Coursera is uh, one way that you can satisfy the work search requirements. And the uh, original um, agreement that we had with Coursera was going to end enrollments on September 30th. They have extended the registration period. And so now people have until October 31st to sign up for classes. Um, again, the, the courses need to uh, complete by the end of the year, but there is still time. So if, you, if somebody had been thinking about it but wasn't sure, um, there's a little bit more time for you to look at it, um, see if it's a good match for you. There are a wide range of courses, and uh, we've talked to many people who are taking a variety of, of courses there, and the feedback that we've been receiving, um, uh, for the most part, I mean, they're rating them 4.5 out of 5% regarding the quality of the, the classes. We also wanted to provide some examples of workshops that are offered through the career centers, and so these are three that are recurring classes. These are uh, happening next week as well as in the coming weeks. One, for instance, is improving your online image, uh, photo and video tips and tricks, uh, ways to improve your online resume, your CSV, for instance. Um, or you can take a resume workshop that would help you develop your resume. Uh, we also have job readiness, helping you getting ready to apply. Um, 
interview preparation, again, resume building, and helping you get through the application process. These are all available at maincareercenter.gov. Uh, the direct website is maincareercenter.com, com slash employment slash workshops. And again, uh, we've heard from some folks who said that they felt very comfortable doing in-person interviews, but now that many interviews are online, uh, they said, what replaces a firm handshake uh, to convey the kind of uh, confidence in an interview? And so those are the kinds of things that uh, some of these workshops will, will help people um, pay attention to or learn, again, tips for interviewing. So Kim mentioned earlier, what, is it, what does able and available um, mean? We use that language a lot. Um, because it's core to unemployment insurance, but what able to work and available to work means that you are physically able to go to work during a week that you're filing. Um, we've received some questions from people who have recently had surgery and they are not able to work and don't understand why they are, are being uh, told that they're not eligible for unemployment during that week. If you are not able to go to work, if you're a call, for example, you're in the hospital, um, then you would not be eligible for unemployment benefits. Uh, this is, uh, I think sometimes there's confusion between like a temporary disability program and unemployment insurance. And for unemployment insurance, you need to be able to work and then available to work. So if you're offered uh, work during that week, would you be free to work um, when, when that's offered. Uh, another um, uh, misconception that people have is that if you're filing for unemployment, it's okay to go on vacation or, or something like that. If you're on vacation, then you would not be available to work during that week. And again, um, that would mean that you are not eligible for benefits that week. You also could be partially um, available uh, to work, and there are partial week benefits that, that are possible. Um, the important thing is to just answer your weekly certifications truthfully, um, and uh, we, I, there's more information on the website about uh, these terms, which we know may not be familiar to everyone. Kim, quarter change. Yeah, we have, uh, we're coming up on the end of the, the quarter, September 30th, obviously, and we wanted to remind you all that we are required um, by federal law to reassess individuals' eligibility for state unemployment at the end of every quarter. So folks who are receiving benefits under one of the federal programs, uh, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, the PEUC, which is the extra 13 weeks, or EB, um, we will be reassessing their eligibility for state unemployment. This means we'll be going back and looking at the, a new base period, for instance, to see if there were wages that would qualify them for state unemployment. So we just wanted to flag that and let folks know that if you uh, receive a new eligibility determination from the department, that this is the reason why. And again, we know that this sometimes causes confusion, but as Kim said, um, we are required to re-evaluate every quarter whether or not someone is, uh, could be covered under state unemployment insurance rather than one of the federal programs because if they are eligible for state unemployment, we need to move them onto the state unemployment program. So, uh, you can oh, okay. okay, go for it. So this next screen is a slide you've seen in the past. It shows the status of the individuals who have filed for unemployment benefits. We're going to focus at the top of the, the bar on the right-hand side. We have 900 people who are in the process, so we have yet to issue a determination on their claim, for instance. We are up over 138,000 individuals who have been paid. Um, we have roughly 3,100 people who are currently ineligible and 200 people that have been flagged as fraudulent. If I could uh, skip to the next slide with a little more detail on the 900 people that are in process. 
um, fairly evenly split. As you can see on the pie chart on the right-hand side, we have 324 people waiting for fact-finding, 325 people who are um, in the process of being transitioned into the PUA program, and then uh, another couple hundred people that are, are truly in process. We're awaiting B1 are those folks that have uh, applied, and we are within the 10-day, initial 10-day period. We've sent information to their former employer looking for information on their separation, and then 140 individuals who are um, in pending status. So this means that we have either a mismatch in the name that they provided, their Social Security number isn't matching with the Social Security Administration, or wages um, that they've reported aren't matching with what we have in the system. And we, in each of those cases, we would be following up on those. On the next screen, this is a breakdown of the 324 individuals who are in fact-finding. Uh, the vast majority of those are cases from September. We have a little over 50 remaining from August and a handful from June and July. Um, as we've mentioned in the past, we have an expedited fact-finding process where we are working through cases um, from oldest to newest. And uh, again, part of that expedited process uh, means that we do have people calling folks. Uh, and uh, if someone is called and it is not, it is before their fact finding uh, had been scheduled, um, a staff ask if the if the person is willing to participate in the fact finding at that point, or if they want to delay it for five days, um, and the fact finding would be scheduled. The reason for um, calling people, again, is to expedite this as much as possible, but it is participation in the expedited process is entirely voluntary. Um, if the person wants to wait, they feel that they don't have all of their information gathered uh, when they're called, that is perfectly okay. We thought that it would be important to go through this um, particular slide again um, e even this afternoon, we've um, talked out a number of names for different unemployment insurance programs, and we thought it would be good to just remind people about what each of them um, means and the duration. So UI, unemployment insurance, this is the state unemployment insurance program. Um, someone, if they have lost a job through no fault of their own, if they're able to work, available to work, and actively seeking work, uh, could be eligible, and they had to be monetarily eligible as well. They need to have had a certain uh, amount of earnings. Um, they could be eligible for up to 26 weeks of unemployment insurance benefits. And when we talked last time, we pointed out that if uh, you started applying for unemployment insurance during that first wave in March, that the 26 weeks would have been up on September 12th. So anyone that fell into that category and they were still unemployed would have then been eligible to move into pandemic emergency unemployment compensation. So that's a federal program that was specifically put in place because of the pandemic. And those people <coughs> would be eligible for up to 13 weeks or up until December 26th, whichever came first. So if you had started in March, um, switched over to PEUC on September 12th, you would uh, exhaust your PEUC benefits on, I want to say, December 12th. December 12th, and then if you were still unemployed, you um, would be eligible for the extended benefit program of up to an additional 13 weeks or until the program ended. Extended benefits are only in place um, if there is a high unemployment rate over a 13-week period in the state. So there is no guarantee that um, there will always be those uh, 13 weeks of benefits at the end. Um, and then if someone rolled into those extended benefits um, and, uh, and they exhausted and it was before December 26, and they were still eligible, they would go into the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program 
um, un until December 26th. So Kim, do you want to talk through that like a little bit more and then talk about the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program and why there's just a solid bar? Sure. For them? Um, so it, you probably didn't notice that this graph looks a little different than the one that we showed in the past. Um, because we, as the Commissioner said, the Extended Benefits or EB program is available when we have high unemployment and in statute that's defined based on claims level. And we've been seeing claims levels decline, um, therefore we are thinking that the Extended Benefits program will run through uh, the end of November or into early December. So therefore it's possible that some of these individuals may be eligible for the PUA program before it ends. Coming down to the, the second line, PUA program is a special program that the CARES Act created, that Congress created, in order to cover individuals who are not normally eligible for state unemployment. And that is the only program that is available for those folks. So there um, isn't any predecessor to the PUA program and then there's no program that comes after it. So if you are on PUA, uh, you will likely stay on PUA unless, of course, as the quarter change comes up, we find that there are wages in our system that would qualify the individual for state unemployment. So we often get asked, you know, my, my benefits on my screen are showing that it's coming close to zero, what am I supposed to do? And we strongly encourage you to just continue filing your weekly certifications. After your account balance hits zero, the following week you'll be asked uh, a series of questions that we use as, in essence, as the application for the next program. So answer those questions and then follow, fill out your normal weekly certifications and then we will um, move you into the next program. Right, and again, the other caveat is if Congress takes some sort of action that December 26th deed could, could change or there could be other programs, but at this point in time, this is the best information that we have. Correct. So um, we did want to just mention that at the Department of Labor there are other programs that we administer in addition to unemployment insurance and on September 14th um, we did uh, adopt the final rules for the earned paid leave program. Uh, this goes into effect January 1st of 2021 um, and what this does is it allows employees who work at a place of business with 10 or more employees to earn up to 40 hours of um, annual paid leave. So again, begins on January 1st, 2021. And we will be doing, um, our Bureau of Labor uh, Standards will be holding uh, um, webinars and going into more depth about uh, what this actually means for individuals and businesses. We also wanted to point out that on January 1st, the minimum wage uh, will increase from $12 an hour to $12.15. This is uh, the result of legislation that was passed several years ago. Um, once the minimum wage goes up, there's also a corresponding uh, increase in the tip wage or service employee wage, the cash wage that servers um, must receive, and that the minimum wage increase also has an impact on the salary threshold um, that uh, exempt workers must earn. So people who are exempt from overtime pay, their um, minimum salary threshold goes up to $700.97 a week or roughly $36,450 a year. Um, and with the uh, exempt uh, from overtime issue, there are a number of factors. One is the salary threshold, another is the duties test, and then the other is the basis um, that they're being paid a salary on. And all of that information is available on our website if people have questions about that. Um, so coming back to unemployment, we've had a few questions about what people have to report on their weekly certifications as far as income is concerned, especially around those who are self-employed. Um, so all individuals are required to report on their weekly certification any wages that they receive from working. And those wages have to be reported in the week that they earn them regardless of when they get paid for those hours. 
Um, some of, so some specific examples of questions we received are, should self-employed individuals who are currently receiving unemployment report IRA withdrawals? So no, IRA withdrawals do not need to be reported by any claimant. Um, just on a related note, pensions usually require a fact-finding interview to determine whether or not they should be reported because pensions, it, it's, it's um, based on the percentage that the individual contributes to the pension as well as their employer contributes. But um, IRA withdrawals themselves do not need to be reported. And the second question we get is, should self-employed individuals who are receiving unemployment report receipt of grant funds? And if so, how? Um, I'm not talking about um, PPP or EIDL funds, but grants that come from um, other organizations. So the only portion of a grant that has to be reported is the portion that would pay that individual's salary. So if a person who's self-employed gets a grant and they're paying their workers with it, um, that would not need to be reported. If they got a grant to upgrade a facility, that would not need to be reported. But if the grant was for salaries in general, they paid their workers and they paid themselves, then they would need to report the amount that they used to pay themselves. So, and I think we mentioned this last time um, that we are, uh, you know, we heard loud and clear uh, that there are ways that we can improve our services and we um, took that to heart and we are focusing on uh, ways that um, will make the, the biggest difference to the most people um, as quickly as possible. And so in the last week, we sent out about 16,000 surveys. Uh, these, the participants were just randomly so selected from, uh, both from people who have applied for unemployment insurance as well as people who are using our reemployment services through the career centers. And we are um, looking and sorting all of the questions, uh, all of the responses that we received and will be um, putting together a work plan moving forward about what, what are the things that we can implement quickly based on um, the responses that we've received. So if you receive a survey, please complete it. We, we are looking at all of that information. So that's the end of our presentation, and um, we're not currently able to see any questions that were put into the chat, so feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Hi, Commissioner. This is uh, Representative Scott Cuddy. I apologize um, for being late coming in today. Um, I did have a couple of questions. Um, one is, the, uh, in, the, in the news media, I still see reported the number of claims, and you've made it clear in the past that claims are not necessarily representative of exactly the same number of people. Um, do you have a figure for how many um, people there are currently in the state of Maine who meet the definition of, of unemployed? So, Representative, um, it, it, that sounds like a very straightforward, simple question, and I wish it was. I mean, what we can do is we can tell you how many people are currently receiving unemployment insurance, but that number is different than um, the number of people who are uh, counted, you know, when we do the um, monthly um, unemployment rate that's released, that's, that's a different uh, number and it's based on a different calculation. So the number of people roughly who are um, receiving unemployment insurance at this point or filing for unemployment insurance is about 76,000 people. Um, does that answer your question, Representative? It, it does. My, um, I know there are a number of different unemployment standards and different numbers, and, and that's, that's really what I was hoping to get at is um, we, we see the number of people who are filing claims or the number of claims filed, but it was the number of people who are filing those claims is really what I was hoping to get at. And that, I think that 76,000 number is what I was hoping to get at. And then the other, and I apologize too for not having sent these um, questions in uh, by the, the earlier deadline. Um, and if you don't have this number, you can email it to me. But uh, the amount of money that is currently in uh, the trust fund. 
Um, we post that number on the website. And I know we looked at that because we did see your questions, even though we couldn't factor yeah. them into the, the presentation. Okay. At the end of okay. July, it was about $500 million. I'm looking Five, at that. 505487 in July. Million. 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 And then um, we'll be updating the August numbers probably next week. Yeah. So we'll, have, we'll post the updated number on the website next week. Okay. Great. Thank you both so much. Commissioner, uh, this is Shana Bellows, and thank you for um, hosting this webinar today to help us sort of get a sense of where things are at and, and help spread the word of the requirements for work search, which are going to be so important. And I've asked this question before, and I know it's terribly, you haven't been able to pull this data before, but one of the questions that I have is whether confusion or difficulties around work search is creating a drop off in the number of successful claims. Do you have any data in terms of um, weeks where people were denied because of failure to do a work search and then came back on board? Um, are you tracking the fall off due to failure to do work search in any way? Or is there any way to do that? So I, I'm sorry, Senator, I don't have any data uh, read, readily available, um, but I do um, want to say that uh, when someone does not complete their work search, they do receive a notice um, letting them know it's basically a warning during the, uh, the week that they, are, um, that they have filed for. Uh, so it's almost like a grace period, a one week grace period to make sure that they do understand what the requirements are and we are sending uh, letters to people with the requirements. So. Uh, hopefully, uh, people do understand what the work search requirement is. Maybe for the next briefing, would there be a way to track how many of those notices are getting issued each week? I mean, where we, my concern we, comes from is just, I know that the number of jobs is far less than the number of people who are currently out of work. And so I think it's wonderful that people can do Casera or other coursework to achieve that work search, but I do worry um, about making sure that people know what their rights are and, and, and making sure that they um, are getting what they need during this time. Yeah, I, I hear the concern. One thing I do want to say is the numbers that we post about jobs that are available are the numbers of jobs that are posted with the main job link. Those are not all of the jobs that are available in the state of Maine. That is uh, the main job link is a free service to employers. We encourage all employers to list their jobs there because then that's an easy way to do a match and we um, can work with the uh, employers to kind of target, um, you know, information to people in particular parts of the state. Like, you know, there are certain kinds of jobs. We can do emails to folks to make sure that they're aware of them, but there is no requirement for employers to list their jobs with us. And there are a number of other services that employers do use. So I, I, I just want to be clear that there are more than 13,000 jobs available in the state of Maine. The 13,000 jobs that we talked about are the ones that are directly listed with us. That's helpful. Um, and I think people are aware of that. I still think that the number of jobs in Maine right now is less than the number of workers, but even cumulatively. Um, but this, I have another question. You said people can report partial availability um, and collect partial unemployment. Can you speak about that for a minute? I have heard from some constituents who have very young children who ordinarily would have been going to school five days a week. And now because of hybrid models are, um, home uh, two or three days a week and at school two days a week. And so parents are suddenly in a very different position than they were a year ago and trying to navigate that. So can you just talk about how one might apply for partial unemployment if they're, um, say, a parent or a caregiver in a situation like this right now? We want to talk about just how to fill it. I mean, it's mm -hmm. the same weekly certification that you would normally fill out. It's not a 
It's not a separate process or a separate form. Right. Right. So one of the questions, let's let's say, were you available to work uh, during the week? If an individual said no, um, then they would be prompted to indicate which days of the week they would have been unable to work. And then if it was um, two days out of the seven, then they, we would subtract those two days uh, from their weekly benefit. Are there other questions? I just I want to say thank you very much for continuing the briefings. I really, I really appreciate it. Oh, um, I didn't want to dominate things, but I do have a question that I think I sent in an e sent in an email. Um, if people are not eligible for the, um, if they are found not to be eligible for the FEMA money um, from August through September, uh, because their unemployment was not due to COVID, are they going to get a denial letter, and is there an appeals process? for them to then engage in. Um, it seems really clear to people if their benefit is not $100 and that's easy for us to explain to people. But there are other folks who just haven't either seen anything in their correspondence tab or heard anything yet. So we are continuing to send um, uh, correspondence out to people. In fact, there, there are some that will be going out tonight. So I would just encourage people to continue to uh, check their correspondence file. Uh, there, unfortunately, this, um, and we're verifying this, but um, it's my understanding since this is a FEMA program that uh, there is no appeal to the FEMA um, 300 wage, uh, 300 uh, benefit amount. The, uh, the appeal would be on the underlying unemployment insurance reasons. So if someone was being denied because of the underlying um, unemployment issue, they would do the normal uh, process. But the, the, the lost wage assistance benefit um, itself, uh, it's my understanding there is not an appeal process for that. Uh, but we have asked for additional clarification on that. Okay, well, well, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon.